This is footage of Pakistan carrying out its first nuclear weapon tests on 28th May 1998, also known as Yom Tafir, which officially made us the first Muslim country to possess nuclear power and enabled us to form a strong security shield against India. But a lot of the key people behind making Pakistan a nuclear power didn't quite get the heroic ending one would have expected. For example, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto was hung and Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan was put under lifelong house arrest. So let's have a look at how Pakistan became a nuclear power and why did this stir so much controversy around the world? Pakistan's journey to becoming a nuclear power was a response to its security challenges, especially from India. The turning point in Pakistan's nuclear ambitions came after the 1971 war when we lost East Pakistan, which was a major blow to Pakistan's security and national pride. This, along with the fact that India was building its nuclear power, prompted Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, who was then Prime Minister, to push for Pakistan's defence capabilities. And so in 1972, Bhutto convened a meeting of leading scientists in Multan and famously declared that Pakistan would acquire nuclear weapons even if the country had to eat grass to achieve this goal. After India's first nuclear test in 1974, codenamed Smiling Buddha, Bhutto intensified efforts by mobilizing resources and assigning Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission, which was led by Munir Ahmed Khan, to begin working on a plutonium-based program. But the real breakthrough came when Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan, a metallurgist working in Europe, returned to Pakistan in 1975 with blueprints of how to make a nuclear bomb, something that, much to everyone's surprise, he would have to pay a heavy price for later. Dr. Abdul Qadir Khan's family had migrated from Bhopal to Karachi in 1952, and that's where he got his bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Karachi. After working briefly for the government, he was accepted for a PhD in Germany. And here's something interesting that a lot of you may call the butterfly effect, because during his wanderings in Europe, he ran into a Dutch woman who later became his wife. And that's what prompted his move to Louvain to study advanced metallurgy and eventually his employment at the Almelo Uranium Enrichment Plant. And it was at this plant where over the next three years, Dr. A.Q. Khan gained access to its classified centrifuge designs. So obviously, when India carried out its nuclear tests in 1974, A.Q. Khan immediately contacted Bhutto and in December 1975, he abruptly left his job and returned to Pakistan with blueprints and photographs of the centrifuges and contact information for dozens of companies that supplied the components. And that's when the real work began. In 1976, he founded the Engineering Research Laboratories and formed his base in Kahuta. And he wasn't alone. He had immense help from a lot of government officials such as Aftab Ghulam Nabi Qasi, Ghulam Isaq Khan, Aga Shahi, and many others. According to interviews, AQ Khan and his team's nuclear device was ready as early as 1984, but they didn't carry out their tests until May 28, 1998, right after India did. The tests were carried out in the Chagai Hills in Balochistan and made Pakistan the world's seventh nuclear power. मेरे लिए तो बहुत खुशी का मौका है कि आज मैं आजादी तौर पे इस जगह पे आया हूं जहां पाकिस्तान ने अपने न्यूक्लियर टेस्ट किए हैं। The moment was celebrated as a national triumph and Dr. A.Q. Khan was hailed as a hero. But the international community and especially the US was not happy and they immediately imposed a bunch of sanctions on Pakistan. And then they came for the man behind it all. In March 2001, General Pervez Musharraf suddenly removed Dr. A.Q. Khan from the chairmanship of the Kahuta Research Laboratories and then Western intelligence agencies accused Dr. A.Q. Khan of sharing nuclear technology with Iran, Libya and North Korea. The CIA director of that time, George Tenet, went as far as to say that A.Q. Khan is at least as dangerous as Osama bin Laden. This was largely because after 9-11, the US feared that terrorists could get a hold of weapons of mass destruction and so Pakistan's nuclear weapons, along with Dr. A.Q. Khan, became a prime target. Their investigations claim that Khan had allegedly run a proliferation network and sold sensitive nuclear secrets and equipment. And so, in 2004, General Pervez Musharraf forced Dr. A.Q. Khan to appear on national television and take sole responsibility for all of it. The investigation is established that many of the reported activities did occur and that these were inevitably initiated at my behest. But it was quite obvious that he was just a scapegoat for a state-sanctioned operation. In fact, he himself said in a later interview with AFP that I saved the country for the first time when I made Pakistan a nuclear nation and saved it again when I confessed and took the whole blame on myself. Journalist Gordon Carrera writes that sometimes it was suggested that Khan was simply after the money. But it wasn't that simple. As well as working closely with his country's leadership, 
he wanted to break the Western monopoly on nuclear weapons. He questioned why some countries should be allowed to keep the weapons for their security and not others. He said that they dislike him and accuse him of all kinds of unsubstantiated and fabricated lies because he disturbed their strategic plans. And the betrayals didn't stop there because later on in his book, Musharraf wrote that Dr. Ikyu Khan transferred nearly two dozen P1 and P2 centrifuges to North Korea. But he forgot to clarify how this big of an operation was possible to manage for a single man with all the heavy machinery and that too without the knowledge of the military establishment. And so Dr. Ikyu Khan was placed under house arrest and although a court ended his arrest in February 2009, his movements were still strictly guarded. Even then, he continued to write a weekly column in Jung newspaper by the name of Seher Honetak, proving not just his love for science and knowledge, but also for his country. His life came to an end in October 2021, and thankfully he was given a state-level funeral, because if it wasn't for him, Pakistan would have not been able to withstand any kind of pressure from India.